Welcome to Bronx Talk. There's a proposal to site a homeless shelter at 2248 Webster Avenue that has outraged two Bronx community boards, Board 5 and Board 6. They say they're saturated with shelters and they claim they're being unfairly overburdened. But the city is in crisis with a reported of more than 100,000 homeless people. The already crowded shelter system is overflowing. Tonight we have representatives from those two community boards to discuss that controversy and other issues in their districts. Please join me in welcoming the district manager of Community Board 6. It is Rafael More Panet. Nice to see you, Mr. Panet. Thank you for having me. And uh, from Community Board 5, it's district manager Ken Brown. Mr. Brown, nice to have you with us. My pleasure, Gary. Thank so you. now I, it took me a moment to figure it out why two community boards. So the shelter is right on the border. Webster Avenue is the border between Community Board 5 and Community Board 6. So this, the, the proposed shelter is in your community. What's the problem? What's the issue? Uh, the Department of Homeless Services doesn't have a policy for citing shelters. So essentially what is happening wait, is... Wait, let's just repeat that. <laughs> because it, it seems just incredible yes. that there's no policy on how to do it. Right. Um, essentially, the nonprofit providers that uh, run the shelters get to decide where they're located. Uh, the city puts out a citywide request for proposal yeah. asking to, you know, we need, we need more shelters, right? There's demand for shelters. We have people in the, in, in the facilities. We need more locations. Where do the providers think are the best locations? The providers find where there are empty buildings or underutilized spaces, where it's the cheapest to build. 2248 Webster is one of these locations. It seems like it was an apartment building at some point. It's been vacant for a while. This is, I guess, cheaper than building a new facility in a fancier part of town. Um, and so that's where they decide to open the shelter, but it's not really subject to a review of is this the best location for the residents or the best location citywide. And so the, the not-for-profits, and there are many providers, they, I'm going to guess, they work with developers and, and real estate people. So rather than have the city decide this is the best place, this is where maybe it's near a school, not a near a school, or there's shopping in the area, whatever it is, rather than those decisions being made by somebody who has the, the large vision, the decisions are being made by developers who say, oh, here's property, I can do it. That's Correct. pretty, that's pretty, it's a, it's a revelation to me to, mm -hmm. to understand that. Um, uh, what's the status of this? Is this just gonna happen? Or is it just a matter, because of course there was a big hearing and um, people had their say, you both had your say. Um, where, where are we at? It seems that the shelter is going to open at some point this summer. Um, I haven't seen the construction start yet, but it, it should be at some point this year. Um, our boards had a joint meeting to talk about it. We raised concerns about it to DHS. We sent letters. The council members sent letters. There was a lot of kind of protest and response to it. Um, but what we're seeing in New York is that when certain neighborhoods protest a shelter, they get their way. And when other neighborhoods protest, they don't get their way. The city doesn't take them seriously. And with the lack of a citywide policy, it allows for these discrepancies where neighborhoods that have more power and more politically connected can say no, and other neighborhoods can't say no. Uh, but we'll get to you in a second, Mr. Brown. We have a, a list of all the community boards and the numbers of shelters in each. Um, I, I mentioned it, and I know you both believe that um, your districts are being overburdened. Maybe we could put that list up there. There you go. So let's, let's just look at, at community boards. So community boards one, two, you can see Community Board 1 has 11, Community Board 2 has 9, Community Board 3 has 17. Those are in the southernmost part of the Bronx. In the central part of the Bronx, Community Boards 4, 5, and 6 um, have 26 
shelters. Now, let's realize this was as of March 2021. Right. It's somewhat remarkable that the city uh, doesn't have those updated like every year. One would think they would want to be counting. Um, Ken Brown is jumping out of his skin to talk about this. We'll give you that. I just want to review this. Community Board 7, which is um, the Bedford Park Norwood area, has 10. The Northwest Bronx and Community Board 8 has one. There is a proposed shelter coming. Uh, Community Board 9 has six. 10 has three. Community Board 11 doesn't have any. And Community Board 5 has 12. Uh, Mr. Brown, you're, he's, he's like, okay. So w what do you make of this and what it, what position does it put you and the, your uh, colleagues in Community Board uh, 5 in to try and the, sort it out? It, it's very interesting because when I called the Department of Homeless Services to get the number from them of the shelters that are in Community Board 5, I was told 13. So, so even these numbers that say 20... Maybe we don't, we don't know. Right. Right. And of course, part of the issue is the relative transparency of the data that DHS is providing. And as I'm sure, Ralph, and you know, what constitutes a shelter? There are the facilities that the Department of Homeless uh, Services runs. Those are shelters. HPD runs shelters. The Red Cross runs shelters. So how do you count them? So, so you know, I was just going to ask you, you know, you know your district very well. You know all the streets of your district. You or others or, you know, people in the community board could, couldn't go through and just check them off and count them because you don't know what's where. There's that. And I, I don't know about Ralph, but in our district, we don't have a helicopter. So to go around and <laughs> I, I know counting about them. It. He doesn't have one either. <laughs> So to actually do that footwork would be an investment of resources we don't have. Wow. So it's anecdotal. Um, you, you, uh, your background, you were telling me beforehand that you work doing case um, management for homeless people. What do, why do communities not want them? If, now let's just do best case scenario. So you've got a, a facility, they provide some services in that facility for people who need need a, a home? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I know there was a who was it George Carlin who called it houselessness, not homelessness. Um, w why is it that people in um, communities are so concerned about having these in their community? I, what, what is the negative effect that drives so many communities crazy? I think that there's a number of potential answers to that, both mythological and real. Um, there's a perception that shelters drive down property values. I, I'm not sure if the data is conclusive around that, but that's certainly a perception. Um, there's the notion that in our communities, in communities like ours, we are the dumping ground. Like Raphael said, we don't, our protests are not as significant, so we wind up being saturated. In, in one of our, our communities, on Mount Hope Avenue, on Jerome Avenue, you can, you can count the number of shelters as you walk between blocks. So we're saturated and there's a sense that these are people, many of them have concerns and issues and problems. So they're released into the community that is already significantly underserved. Uh, poverty be the number one, I'm guessing, uh, without any science, but just having sat in the seat. Poverty would be a number one issue um, um, drug abuse would be a, number one, a, a difficult issue. Mental health would be a, a difficult issue. And of course, unemployment would be a major domestic issue. Domestic violence is a and huge domestic driver. Domestic violence yeah. would be another issue. Um, have, you, have you seen um, this, this kind of, like, like does the NYPD report that these sectors have uh, more crime or more of those kinds of uh, issues? There is a system in place for oversight over shelters, but DHS is not accurately following the system that was established. So historically what has happened is every homeless shelter in New York City is supposed to have a quarterly community advisory board meeting. Right. This is where the shelter provider meets with the precinct, meets with the elected officials, meets with stakeholders in the neighborhood to talk about the operations of the shelter. How many people moved out? How many people got into permanent housing? Sounds reasonable. Sounds reasonable, right? And also a way to address the quality of life issues that loitering outside would cause in a neighborhood and address them so the provider knows what can be addressed. In community board six, 
uh, a community advisory board meeting run by a shelter provider had not occurred for three years until three I came years. Here. And what is it supposed to be like monthly? Quarterly. Or? Quarterly. Quarterly. So you need four a year. So for three years you missed twelve. <laughs> missed twelve. Well, and that, I did the math. And with twenty something shelters, I mean, how many meetings did we miss? So this means that there was no oversight over the local shelter operations, which I think feeds into the fear about what happens when a shelter comes into my neighborhood. If there isn't oversight, then you could potentially have the quality of life issues that they're concerned about in neighborhoods that push back. Um, in our district, we finally were able to get some community advisory boards started by reaching out to DHS. But now the, the, the new advisory boards that we're getting um, are without data, which is a new issue. Oh, wow. In the past, when these advisory board meetings would happen, they would be data presented. This is the number of people that moved in and out, et cetera, et cetera. Here are the operations, violations on record. And now, then, excuse me, oh, yeah, and yeah. you could match it up with other issues, with NYPD stats and, and yes. other um, you know, uh, hospitalizations, I mean, all, all those kinds of things. Right. Um, now what DHS has told us, and this is news to me and maybe, maybe news citywide, um, that they are no longer producing any data related to shelter operations. That we no longer have the right to access this data. It's called a scorecard, that every but, shelter gets a scorecard. Well, listen, uh, we, we, we certainly could, um, uh, you could certainly sue for public data, no? I mean, <laughs> one would think. D you know, go right ahead and do it, I realize that. DHS alleges that there is information on the scorecard that is you know, private to the residents. I don't want to endanger resident lives. From what I've heard from other district managers that there is no private information on these scorecards. It's all meta. And so I, this seems to just be a, a, an excuse not to provide the data. Well, anymore. you know, it reminds me, it, it resonates very um, directly from uh, uh, the uh, corrections people saying they don't, no longer want to release the data when somebody dies at Rikers. I mean, oh, wow. it's just, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, go ahead, you were gonna add something to that. We, we have had community advisory boards both prior to COVID and during COVID. They were, they were virtual, but as you pointed out, Gary, I suspect a lot of that is the previous relationship that I had with providers. So the enforcement, as Raphael said, by the Department of Homeless Services is, to be polite, scattered. Now, at the at this the is meetings, really a problem. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, certainly. At the meetings, they would talk about the number of moveouts they had per month, what their target for the moveouts are, the quality of incidents. And, and let me ask you this, because you know case management. So people who move out, are they moving out because they've now got homes, or because they can't stand living in those places, or you know right. what I mean? In other words, are they moving out because they're just going out and now they're going to be in the street and still be a, a burden to all of us? Or are they moving out because, goodness gracious, they got a job, they are able to find an apartment they can afford, et cetera? I think, I think there's a galaxy of reasons why people move out. Um, and that varies significantly about whether it's family shelters or single adult shelters, and the quality of problems and issues varies by those types. For the family shelters, in my experience, people move out because they found housing. Well, that, that, that would, to me, would be good news. Here's a question nobody wants to answer, and you don't have to answer it because it's politically charged. This is not the first year that we're dealing with these kinds of issues. So it's, you can easily say, well, Mayor Adams, this, I mean, but you know, you know who the mayors were, Giuliani, Bloomberg, de Blasio, uh, Adams, this has been a, this has been ongoing, right? We've had a housing crisis since 1965 when they invented the term. Um, one of one of the things um, that um, came up in in the meetings you've had is to try and build rather than have two community board members bring in more community boards. But you know, maybe some community boards like the ones we uh, looked at before are going to say, "Hey, I don't want to get involved in that because we're happy where we are." Um, right. where, where are we at as trying to brill, build unanimity with community boards? Because you guys know the grassroots of what's going on. Uh, I would say we started having conversations between district managers and boards this year, because I think we have, we realize we have a lot of common in the South Bronx and Central Bronx. Um, but you're right that there are boards that are, you know, opposed to a, a policy because without a policy, they're able to resist and get their way if they have more connections or... So they may not want to sit at the same table as you because your issues are different. You know, there was a fair share rule in 1990. <laughs> right. I said that and Ken Brown actually laughed. That's not <laughs> funny. Um, and, and, and so we, have, we also can show you um, per borough uh, where we're at in terms of the, let's, let's put that up on the screen. 
where we're at in terms of the number of shelters in each borough. So Staten Island has one. Queens, which has more people than uh, live in the Bronx, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, yep. uh, by, a, by a lot, yep. um, has 75. Manhattan has 114. The Bronx with 129. And Brooklyn, which has maybe a, about a million more people than there are in the Bronx, has 130. So per capita, you can do the math. The Bronx is, is right. kind of... Get, getting beat, so to speak, mm -hmm. on this level. Now, I want to ask you this, and, and I remember this dialogue for years and years. We want to put shelters in the locations where the people are located. Right. So, unfortunately, if homeless people are in community board six, mm -hmm. are in you know some of your from, neighborhood, yep. or come from those neighborhoods, we don't want to displace them and move them to Queens or somewhere else. I think it makes sense. It's unfortunate. Do you, do you both need to share that burden to some degree or uh, understand that burden? Yeah, and, and, and my board is, is more than, and my residents my, my district are more than happy to, to take on their fair share of the burden. But what has been created is a self-perpetuating cycle. There aren't enough eviction prevention services. There's a very high eviction rate in the neighborhood. So there's a lot of people in the shelter system from yes, the neighborhood. that's another thing yep. is the eviction yep. rates. So then there are more facilities built in the neighborhood. And then because there are more facilities in the neighborhood, there's less affordable housing and the, and the, and the cycle perpetuates mm -hmm. of more and more people entering the shelter system from my district and more and more shelters being built in the district. Uh, you worked in housing court. Yep. Um, what what uh, relief can the housing court provide or is it just too complicated, too difficult for people to get their cases heard? Um, you know, the, the landlords, you know, they delay, they delay, they delay. You can never get stuff. That, what is? Does it provide any relief in this, or it, it, forget it? <laughs> uh, I mean, housing court. Sorry to be so blunt. I mean, housing court was established in the '60s to address housing code violations. That's the purpose of housing court. What then happened was all the rent cases that were in civil court were moved to housing court, and housing court became a rent collection court, where that was not the original intention. Um, I mean, tenants have the right to go to housing court and file a case for repairs. That's really you know, the, the best possible scenario of why you're in housing court is you're there for repairs. Everyone else that's there for rent is really a, a really inefficient system for extracting rent from tenants that can't afford their rent. And there aren't enough services, there aren't enough attorneys, the city funded right to counsel and there are too many cases right now. Um, so really right to counsel is not addressing the needs of housing court. So tenants walk in without any information, owing thousands of dollars, don't have an immediate plan for how to get the rent paid. Negotiate Please. with a lawyer in the hallway, so right. the judge without outside well, the presence of the judge. I remember that before we had the new housing court, and it right. was done in the basement of what it, you know, the, the old well, old courthouse on 161st. Tenants sign their life away because they're scared and are on the hook for money they may or may not owe. If they have a subsidy, they may not even owe the money, but they don't have access to legal information to know what in fact they should argue, and they're on the hook and they can't pay it. And then the evictions roll through, and that's really what housing court has become. Um, the other thing which I mentioned very briefly, Mr. Brown, is that um, people sometimes say, I, I can't, I'm not staying in the shelters mm -hmm. anymore. What is the state of shelter housing? Like, where are we at? In terms of... As far of, as you know. Right. In terms of being able to move people out of shelters into affordable housing? Well, no, really. What's it, what's it like to live there? Is it a way, is oh. it a way for... You know, is it horrible? In, is it crime ridden? It, are, are, you know, are, can can people, you know, have families there? I mean, we know that ten percent of public school children come out of right, shelters at right, this point. Right. I, again, it varies. Um, in family shelters, you are afforded what is essentially an apartment, um, and those vary by provider, of course. Um, and then in the single single adults. That is barracks. People have cots with a locker next to the cot in 20, 20, 30 peak cots to a room. Wow. So it's, it, it's a spectrum, you know, and I've had people when I was a case manager say, I can't, I can't do this. You know, my next question for both of you is going to be how are we going to solve this? Um, <laughs> but if DHS doesn't show up at meetings like the one you held, I, I, I don't know how you can, so, um, unless you literally, you know, spend a lot of money on legal support and take them, take everybody to court, take right. the city to court. Good luck. Right. 
And in our experience, when the Department of Homeless does, Services does come to announce a shelter being put in, they're very defensive. And the opportunity to engage with them in a congenial, constructive dialogue is difficult. Sounds to me, just from this dialogue, that one of the solutions would be to have legislation of some sort to force the city to take responsibility to cite the shelters. You, you like that idea? I mean, the, get, get, this is what Gary suggests. <laughs> The fair share rules need to be up to date. They don't have a strong enough enforcement mechanism. And so on paper, there are supposed to be all these, you know, uh, considerations that go into right, right. fair share citing. There's a document that's created that the boards have access to, which is essentially just saying, you know, there's 15 shelters and a half mile. Looks great to us. Sign off on it. Um, and so without a real enforcement mechanism with fair share, the rule doesn't really mean anything. You know, there's um, uh, this This just happened. It's not in your district. Uh, Manhattan College sold a building on West 231st Street to Stag. And, and we interviewed oh. uh, last week um, Jeff Dinowitz, uh, Assemblyman Dinowitz was here. And he said that they are not always that reliable because then all of a sudden they will go open a homeless shelter. He said a homeless shelter doesn't belong there. Um, this is this is an example of how this process works. And, not to, and, and I'm not saying that's what's going to happen up there, but I'm just using that because it, it just happened, right? This is how, how an example of how it doesn't work. I think, I mean, like, there is a system for rolling out shelters. I mean, DHS has a process by which they do it. But it's interesting to see that in certain neighborhoods, when they get to, you know, 20 feet from the finish line, and there's all this community protest at the board meeting, then the city decides, okay, this is untenable, we're going to step back and pull it back. And that seems to be coming from the top. That seems to be coming right. from City Hall, because DHS gets right to the end of the finish line, and then at the last minute says, oh, people in this neighborhood are upset at a meeting, we're gonna cancel the whole thing. Uh, I want to uh, get to a couple of other things before we run out of time. Um, let's just talk about um, small businesses in both of your communities. We'll start with you, Mr. Brown. Um, in Community Board 5, I mean, I know the shopping strip on Burnside Avenue quite well. Um, they're shopping on Jerome Avenue and all, all that. Um, wh where are we at? We're doing okay or we still need more support or well, we what are businesses say? <laughs> we certainly need more support. Um, COVID and then the, the uh, difficulties that happened after the Floyd George murder, uh, Burnside was the hardest hit disc commercial district in the city from the looting. So oh. we had problems with our merchants getting insurance you know, if they had road insurance. Had issues as well. Go ahead. I'm right. sorry. Um, during during COVID, getting the um, the PPP uh, grants was very very difficult for our community well, because I, I mean, they well, don't have the back office. Let's just jump in. A lot of that monies were not spent. We know right. that that there were piles of money still still out mm -hmm. there. Um, but wh what what do we need now to invigorate the uh, ec economies there? Especially when it's, you know the, you could look at the median incomes in these neighborhoods and not that right. high that people can just spend a lot of money. Th there's a couple of things. There's of course a raft of resources that we need. Um, the Center for an Urban Future had a conference in May talking about support for small businesses. And what came out of that is we would like the city to have a more robust or a, a program to help small businesses with social media. How do they engage ah, in social media? Because, because traditional ways of, of, of promoting may not be as effective sure. as it used to These are mom and pop bodegas that have been handed oh, down from idea. father to son. How do you engage the internet? That, that's an issue. Wow. When the grants came out, sorry, when loans are made available, right. it's very hard for our community to access them because they can't afford, they can't afford debt. Right. They don't have the back office technique to, to technology do to do that. It. So, um, yeah. how's Arthur Avenue? <laughs> Sorry, everybody wants to know how's Arthur Avenue. How's Arthur Avenue? I mean, Arthur Avenue benefits immensely from having a bid, and the bid is able to do a lot of this organizing right. and support and, okay. and back back house of those things that other businesses in our district really wish they could get access to. Um, you know, we've been I've been doing some meetings with merchants on East Tremont. And Tremont is, again, a large commercial strip, used to be very active, now really has hit hard times. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've kind of had some initial conversations with businesses, but I think, you know, a bid is, again, a, a financial obligation on the, on, the, on the property owner. And so the challenge for us has been kind of what are the immediate steps along the way of, obviously, a bid could be an end goal for a commercial district, but what can we do to support along the way? 
to provide information and resources. Uh, you have a bid at, on Fordham Road, yes. and uh, that does very well, but you were concerned about Fordham Plaza. I think we have some pictures yep. of it. What's going on in Fordham Plaza? Um, the department- the center in the borough of the Bronx. Yes. The Department of Transportation has found it's not necessary to appoint a borough commissioner in the Bronx for the past two years. And with this lack of leadership, we've seen many capital projects that DOT is supposed to manage, at least in our district, fall to the wayside um, with no attention put on them. The key one being Fordham Plaza, right? So as you mentioned, transit hub, thousands of people pass through every day on multiple- And, and you know, we're looking at, at right now these, these pictures, right. yep. wasted opportunities. You could have, especially if we're looking for people who want to create small businesses, there's been a lot of interest in entrepreneurship yep. and all yep. that. This plaza was completed seven years ago and there's still no retail in the plaza, which really shows that DOT has not been willing to put the attention and time to make this, this plaza This is active. DOT property? Oh, yep. Managed oh. by DOT. Yeah. So it's not like the, the, the Fordham bid, which is incredibly active and, <laughs> and certainly has a lot to deal with. Right. But that, if, if we said, hey, why don't you guys take the property? But because it's been a transit hub. You know, let's compare it to, to the hub, uh, you know, down in, where 250,000 people traverse through there. But, you know, there, there's a lot of attention paid to it. And, and, um, but you're saying that Fordham has been neglected in that way. Uh, there have been several RFPs issued for these kiosks. They find a vendor, the vendor backs out. I think the problem is the language of the RFP that the city is using. They're not even charging rent for these stands. They want to give you the stand and then you are responsible for, for maintaining the physical space. And the this, insurance. And the insurance, yeah, and right, the and insurance. the liability. Yeah. And the liability could be millions of dollars. This is a yeah. plaza built on top of train tracks. So if the plaza cracks, you're on the hook for millions of dollars in repairs. Yeah. And so. I don't want to scare businesses away. We want to find businesses that want to take over these stands, but the current RFP model the city's using is not working. Multiple times now, someone has accepted it and then backed out. Let's go for each of you. Um, give me something really good that's going on in Community Board 5 that you're proud of. We, we were the pilot for uh, the Parks Department Catalyst Program. Mm -hmm. So that is bringing community stakeholders, neighbors and things like that to be involved in Aqueduct Walk. We're starting to do that with Richmond Echo Park, which has a storied history. So getting people out and active in the parks and our green spaces and bringing What's people together. What's the biggest together. park in the community? Aqueduct Walk, I would say. Uh, I, lo I love that park, by the way. I've spent a lot of time there. And um, for you, what's the, I mean, you, you know, you get a nice sandwich on, in, the, in the Belmont <laughs> market. Yes. What else is going on? Um, the city recently won a federal grant to explore remediating the effects of the Cross Bronx Expressway. Oh, right. And that goodness, is rolling yes. out. Yeah, that is rolling out right now. There have been a bunch of Thank workshops. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, getting input on what, what issues residents want to address that were caused or, or, or connected to the Cross Bronx Expressway. And we're looking forward to the city finding out those issues and working on addressing them. Listen, uh, you want to find, about, find out about Grassroots Bronx? Let's get to the district managers. That's why we brought you in Ken Brown from um, Community Board 5. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Rafael more Punet, thank you so much. And uh, guess what? That's going to be uh, the end of our program. Thanks to our uh, producer, Rebecca Hammock, our director, Nick Marrero, the cast of thousands <laughs> who work with us here in the studio. And next week, we'll see you. Good night.